Sorry. Hello? Sorry. Uh, today's topic is high flow nasal cannula and non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. We are pleased as always to have Dr. Eugene, Dr. Jean-Paul, Dr. Celestin, and Dr. Alain to lead us through this presentation. And with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Eugene. So hi everyone. I hope everyone is doing well, um, despite the COVID situation. I hope you are managing well. And thank you for taking the time. Um, so I will be with Dr. Jean-Paul. Uh, I'm not sure if Dr. Ale will be able to join because he's taking care of um, COVID patients. Hi, hi. Um, thank you, Jean-Paul. And Celeste is not available today. So this will be interactive. Uh, it will not take a long period of time because we don't know, we don't have most of these devices in most of our hospitals. But I think it's good to know uh, why they are important to be able to advocate for them and to be ready to use them when available. So I don't know if Jean-Paul has something to add. And then um, after that, we can start. So there, there is no much to add, but uh, I'm on a second call. Uh, I may have some interruption, but I, I hope so that I can uh, have the session with you together. So in, when, whenever, whenever I'm, I'm off, just there, there will be an, an emergency case to take care of. I know that. Okay, thank you. Um, our members of the team, if they have something to talk about, they may put that in the chat. And I will ask Alana to, to share the content on the Learning Resource Center. Yeah, you can go down to, to the um, you can go down here yeah, to the objectives for the day. So as Elena said, today we're going to talk about high flow nasal cannula and non-invasive ventilation. So the objectives for today, we need to be able to understand the upper limit of high low flow devices uh, to differentiate between low flow oxygen therapy and high flow oxygen therapy to understand when to escalate to high flow oxygen therapy, to list proposed benefit of high flow oxygen therapy, uh, to list possible complications for high flow oxygen therapy, and understand how to, to titrate high flow oxygen therapy. And lastly, we, we need to be able to understand how to decrease high flow oxygen therapy. And then we, finish with non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, where we list indication for use, and, and also we list pro the proposed benefit and then the potential complications. So in order to do that, we, we need to start with this case. So we have Mr. G, who, who is a 39 years old patient with five days of worsening shortness of breath and dry cough. His breathing is harder when he gets up and walks around, so he has tried to stay in the bed and rest. He noticed that his fingers and toes are blue, so he's cyanotic when his breathing is worse. So as a past medical history, he, he's obese with a BMI of 35, and he has diabetes type 2 on oral hypoglycemic drugs. So he had appendectomy at age 20, has no allergies, and uh, he works as a painter, he's divorced, and he, his son has 10 years. He doesn't smoke and drinks beer occasionally. So this is the patient we need to keep in mind. So let's continue and then discuss about non-invasive, um, discuss about nasal cannula. So um, first, let's remember that we need PPE, especially in this situation of COVID. 
because if we use a uh, high flow oxygen therapy, uh, this will generate droplets and we may be at risk if the patient has any respiratory disease, especially COVID. So, so both patients and the healthcare provider should have mask on all the time uh, until you are sure that the patient doesn't have any respiratory disease. So for this part, first part, uh, again, we're going to, to be able to understand the upper limit of low flow device. And we have seen that previously. And we, we need to differentiate between low flow and high flow and understand when to, to use high flow. So let me start with a question and I will ask you to put the answer in the chat. So which low flow oxygen delivery device uh, provide um, high, highest FiO2 among those five. So nasocanula, a simple face, face mask, nasocatheter, uh, mask with a reservoir, and ventral mask. You need to choose one. Very good. Okay, perfect. I think most of the people got the right answer, which is D. Uh, so mask for reservoir provides the highest FIO2. I think we don't need to spend much of time on this. We can continue and discuss uh, high flow as a can. So we have the vital signs for a patient, which are the following. So he has a low grade fever of 38 degrees Celsius. He is tachycardic with a heart rate of 99. The blood pressure is normal, 107 over 88. The respiratory rate is increased at 28. The SpO2 is 90% on a facial mask with reservoir at maximum 15 liters per minute. So let's at least few uh, respiratory this signs of respiratory distress in this patient. You can put the answers in the chat. Everyone can put just two signs of respiratory distress in this patient. Okay, yeah, tachypnea, the rate of 28. Okay, keep going. Yeah, high respiratory rate, okay. Okay, so let's click on the common respiratory distress signs in adult, then we watch a, a video to see how our patient is presenting. You can go down that. Yeah, so as you said, the breathing rate, if it is increased or low, color change um, around the mouth or the lips or fingernails, um, when there is low oxygen, they may be pale or gray, or maybe they can become cyanotic. So grunting is abnormal or sound. Then exhalation when there is um, the patient is in the respiratory failure, as of flaring. Um, so retraction, I think people are used to this. We see that on the video, uh, sweating, uh, wheezing, body position when the patient is like uh, leaning forward to take more deeper breaths. So those are a few examples of signs of respiratory failure. So we can go back and watch the video of, our, of the patient for a few seconds. Thank you. 
Okay, I think you can see how the patient had a respiratory distress with the use of accessory muscles and subcostal and intercostal retractions. Um, so here is the question. Uh, so true or false, high flow nasal cannula is oxygen delivery through a standard nasal cannula at flow, flows greater than six liters per minute. Is it true or false? Okay, 10 seconds left. Okay, so yeah, the answer is false. So we'll see why, but, but remember that high flow cannula has a specific device which helps to, to achieve high flow and also to humidify the oxygen and warm the oxygen. So, uh, and the flow can be as high as 60 liters, but usually uh, people use between 20 and 30 liters. So let's continue and watch a video to explain what is high flow oxygen. Alana, can you uh, put in the video? Thank you. So what is high flow therapy? High flow therapy is when oxygen is being delivered to the patient at a flow rate that meets or exceeds their inspiratory flow demand. What does that mean? Well, did you know that at rest, the average adult will inhale at a speed of 20 to 30 liters per minute? In other words, if someone was standing next to you right now with a radar gun pointing at your nose, capable of measuring how fast you're inhaling while you're relaxed, the speed at which you inhale would be at around 20 to 30 liters per minute. So high flow therapy should be capable of matching the inspiratory flow or even exceeding it. If an oxygen device delivers less than the patient's inspiratory flow, then the delivery is called low flow. So because the average adult who is at rest inhales at a speed or flow of 20 to 30 liters per minute, a high flow device should be capable of delivering at least that much. Now, in order for this high flow of oxygen to be comfortable to the patient, the oxygen should be heated and humidified to maximize patient tolerance and comfort. And sometimes you'll see high flow therapy described as heated and humidified high flow oxygen therapy, or heated and humidified high flow nasal cannula, or to keep it short, it may be referred to as HHFNC or HFNC or even HFOT or HFT or some other variation of that. More recently, Vapotherm has chosen to refer to their heated high flow therapy as HVNI. They've even tried to describe HVNI as mask-free NIV, but don't get thrown off. On the FDA's website, it clearly identifies their device type as high flow humidified oxygen delivery device. Now, like other high flow devices, they deliver a high flow of oxygen and it is heated and humidified to help meet patient comfort and tolerance. And some devices, like Vapotherm's Precision Flow, go up to 40 liters per minute. Others, like the FNP Airvo 2, go up to 60 liters of flow, while still others can go even higher because at the end of the day, we're just trying to meet the inspiratory flow of a patient. And when that patient is in respiratory distress, that inspiratory demand can be as high as 100 liters per minute. Yikes. So should high flow therapy be a replacement to other forms of therapy like non-invasive ventilation? The answer, absolutely not. High flow oxygen delivers just that, a high flow of oxygen. But sometimes patients have issues with CO2 or ventilation. 
and not just issues with O2 or oxygenation. NIV is effective for both oxygenation and ventilation. This is why HFT and NIV are often used together on some patients in a complementary fashion. For example, some patients may be on high flow therapy but require more support. Clinicians sometimes escalate to NIV to prevent, if possible, intubation and invasive mechanical ventilation. And if a patient is on NIV and can tolerate short breaks, clinicians sometimes switch to high flow therapy to allow the patient to have that temporary break from NIV where they can eat, talk with their relatives, take an oral medication, you get the idea. In fact, in a Vapotherm sponsored study, there were 104 patients who presented to the ER in respiratory distress and they were initially placed on high flow oxygen. Of those 104 patients, unfortunately, 27 of them failed. And of the 27, four were immediately intubated. But the other 23 patients were switched from the high flow oxygen to NIV. And of the 23 patients who failed with high flow oxygen and were switched to NIV, 20 of them improved and did not need further escalation to intubation. In fact, in another study, patients at high risk of post extubation failure were placed in one of two categories. The first category was high flow therapy only, and the other group allowed for both NIV and high flow therapy. Now, the patients that went on both NIV and HFT had a significantly lower rate of reintubation versus the group that went on HFT only. So don't get confused. HFT is definitely not mask-free NIV. But it is a great tool to treat patients with oxygenation issues who are in respiratory distress. So just a quick final summary on high flow therapy. High flow oxygen therapy usually delivers oxygen at a flow rate equal to or higher than the patient's actual inspiratory flow rate. It should be heated and humidified for patient tolerance. And depending on the flow rate and the seal around the nose and mouth, high flow oxygen may create a CPAP effect, although we don't know exactly how much. It also may wash out some CO2 that is in the upper airway, which is often referred to as CO2 dead space washout. But again, we don't know exactly how much. So that's your quick introduction to high flow therapy. Yeah, I hope that was clear. Uh, this video really helps to provide like a difference between a high flow and a non-invasive ventilation. So if there is other remaining questions, you can put the questions in the chat. So let's continue with our case. So despite receiving oxygen by a mask with a reservoir, so our patient continued to have a fast rate of breathing. So his respiratory rate is now 36. Remember it was 28. So the SpO2 has decreased between, below, from 90 to 88. So the bedside provider decides to place him on high flow. So for this part, we're going to, to see the benefit for high, of high oxygen therapy, discuss about potential complications, and understand how to increase or decrease high flow. So you can put few uh, benefit in the chat. At least everyone can put one or two benefits. Then we, we click on, on the link and see those benefits. Yeah, but what are we trying to achieve on the patient? What are the complications are we trying to minimize? Now keep that in mind while you are talking about benefit.
Yeah. So maybe Arana can click on, on, on the link. But also remember what you are trying to minimize are the complications, including intubation and, and maybe increase the length of stay, ICU admissions, and the mortality. So, um, yeah, so there is a lot of um, evidence showing that high flow oxygen therapy improve or minimize the rate of intubation, uh, which is good. Um, okay, let's see this table. Yeah. Yeah, there are some physiological and clinical benefit. So as you can see, you, you have better patient comfort uh, because you are using small nasal prongs. Um, you, you facilitate removal of secretions, um, avoid epithelial injury, decrease the work of breathing, and enhance patient comfort. Uh, you may improve oxygenation. Uh, for ventilation, it's not as much as oxygenation. So you decrease otopy, you decrease the work of breathing, and enhance oxygenation, as I said. So and it's a reliable delivery of FiO2, and you may improve um, breathing pattern. So I think this, those are some of the benefits. But also there are some studies, we will not go through all of them, but just keep in mind that um, high flow nasal cannula has shown to decrease rate of intubations, but there are no evidence for decreasing mortality. Yeah, I think we can keep that simple. And you can always, you have access to the content, you can go uh, to up to date and read more about that. So let's think about potential complications. Can you think about few complications if we use high flow nasal cannula? Uh, put few answers in the chat. Yeah, very good. Uh, aspiration is the risk. Yeah, what else? Yeah, you have, can have barotrauma, okay. Yeah, oxygen toxicity, motorex. Okay, yeah, that's a good list. Let's click on that and see most of the complications. I don't know, you can maybe go up uh, on, on the left side and then click on complications. It will be easier. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. The, there are some complications, as you can imagine, you're giving high flow about more than 30 liters per minute. So you can cause abdominal distension. You can cause aspiration, as you said, and sometimes you can have barotrauma. So you, you, you answered all the questions, which is very good. So, but also remember risk of barotrauma is lower in comparison to non-invasive ventilation. 
Okay, those are complications. But on top of this uh, paragraph, you can see contraindications. So if there are any abnormalities or surgery on the face or nose, yeah, burn also can be an issue. So uh, that may, may cause difficult in fitting the nasal cannula. And then you may need uh, also to avoid using uh, high flow nasal cannula uh, for people who had upper airway surgery to avoid some risk with high pressure and which may lead to venous thromboembolism. So think about some contraindications, uh, especially for abnormalities on the face, on the nose, and also think about some complications of high pro as we discussed. Uh, so, Eugene, yes, uh, I have something to compliment you. Yes. For our audience, yes, for our audience, just to, to have in mind, uh, in our setting, we don't have this high flow nasal cannula, but uh, what they have to understand is that uh, when you want to maximize oxygenation, uh, when you are providing uh, oxygen via uh, facial mask with the reservoir, which is giving the, the high FI auto. This is the one we have in our setting. So at the moment, uh, you, you can be exhausted and you, you don't want to jump to intubation and mechanical ventilation. In the setting where there is high flow nasal cannula, then you can, you can give the high flow nasal cannula to the, to the patient where you are sure that you can offer at least 100% of FIO2. But the benefit, the benefit we discussed is these are the benefits you a, a can benefit while is avoided with the mechanical ventilation and intubation. These are the actually, if you can avoid to intubate some someone and put on mechanical ventilation in a setting where you have high flow nasal cannula, this is a clear benefit. Regarding to the complication also, the complication also, you have to think about what are the complication of uh, mechanical ventilation, intubating someone, putting someone on mechanical ventilator. All these complications we know, all, all of these complications we know, if you manage to have a high flow nasal cannula, actually you can, you can still have a high FIO2 and the patient is maximized on oxygenation without intubation or mechanical ventilation. For the, the contraindication, of course, this is something you can put on the face of a patient. So the, the one you described, if someone is having uh, facial malformation or other issues around the face. To help our audience, audience to understand it, they can think about simple nasal cannula, what should be the, con the contraindication. This is what I want to compliment you. Thank you very much, Ram, for uh, that's very helpful. Um, so we can skip that. That's just an example of someone who had the complication. So yeah, the next question about high flow nasal cannula is, is about the parameters which you have to set in, in order to, to start high flow therapy, high flow oxygen therapy. So you may put the answer in the chat. So there are three parameters you need to change or to adjust on the high flow um, machine. So what are those fact factors or what are those parameters? I don't know if the question is clear. So what are the three parameters that must be set on high frogs and therapy device by the healthcare provider? 
So the respiratory rate, yeah, that's one. What else? Rate is the flow rate, and if I want to, what else? So if I want to, yeah, remember the patient is breathing by himself. So you are not setting the respiratory rate. So you are setting FiO2 and the other two parameters. Flow rate, yeah. You are not setting the PEEP for this. Okay, yeah, because it's a new topic, we can go down and see the answer. Yeah, you can click on the video and then we see uh, what you have to say. But you can see on the left. So flow rate, if I on the template. In the previous video, we talked a little bit about what high flow therapy is. In this video, we'll quickly highlight the clinical application of high flow oxygen therapy. We already discussed that high flow therapy is not a replacement for non-invasive ventilation because it is not capable of providing the same level of ventilatory support like NIV. In high flow therapy, for example, there is no inspiratory pressure setting, no PEEP or CPAP setting, no backup respiratory rate setting, no inspiratory time setting, no patient ventilatory alarms. You also cannot monitor the tidal volume, the IE ratio, and there are no loops or waveforms. You get the idea. NIV, on the other hand, in fact, the only two main controls on high flow therapy are FiO2 and flow. Let's look at FiO2 first. This is typically adjusted to maintain adequate oxygenation. The FiO2 can be set from a level of 21% to a level of 100%. Usually, patients in acute respiratory distress who are on high flow may initially require a high level of FiO2 to maintain an appropriate saturation. Next is the flow setting. The flow is usually set to try to meet or exceed the patient's inspiratory flow demand. This is challenging because it's difficult to determine what the patient's inspiratory flow is. We learned in the previous video that at rest, when the patient isn't in respiratory distress, the typical inspiratory flow of an adult is around 20 to 30 liters per minute. But for patients in distress, their flow demand will likely be higher. So clinicians often titrate the flow according to the patient's respiratory rate. In other words, the faster the patient is breathing, the more flow they'll probably need. So if you're using the VapoTherm's precision flow device, the highest flow that you can set is 40 liters per minute. On other devices, like the Airvo 2, they can go as high as 60 liters per minute, and still others can go higher. So these two settings, the flow and FiO2, are the two settings available to the clinician to treat the patient in respiratory distress. If the respiratory rate or the CO2 on the arterial blood gas cannot be corrected or stabilized despite a relatively high flow rate setting, you may need to escalate to non-invasive ventilation or even intubation, depending on the severity of the hypercapnia. Likewise, if the pulse ox or the PaO2 on the arterial blood gas cannot be corrected and stabilized despite a relatively high FiO2 setting, then be prepared to escalate to non-invasive ventilation or even intubation, depending on the severity of the respiratory failure and the diagnosis of the patient. But whatever you do, do not delay escalation if the patient does not improve with high flow oxygen. Okay, now remember, because there are no patient alarms and data monitoring is not available on high flow oxygen devices, regular patient monitoring is critical. There is one more control in high flow therapy, and that's the temperature setting. To ensure that the high flow of oxygen is tolerable, heat and humidification should be provided. The exact appropriate temperature setting is debatable, and there currently exists no temperature standard. Some suggest to start at 37 degrees Celsius, others suggest start lower. But the key point in temperature setting is to adjust the temperature based on patient comfort and tolerance. Which patients should high flow therapy be placed on? It's still a bit unclear, but we tend to see good outcomes in patients with what we call 
de novo hypoxemic respiratory failure. De novo hypoxemic respiratory failure is defined as significant hypoxemia but in the absence of chronic lung disease such as COPD. We also do not include the kind of respiratory failure that occurs in the immediate post-operative or post-extubation period. Remember, high flow therapy can deliver a high FiO2 at a high flow rate, so we anticipate it to be beneficial for hypoxemic patients. However, if a patient presents with acute hypercapnic respiratory failure, which is exhibited by an abnormally high CO2 and a corresponding abnormally low pH, then clinicians may want to consider an alternative form of intervention, such as NIV. Well, what about you? How have you seen high flow therapy used? Leave your comments below. I would love to read some of your responses. Yeah, I hope that was clear. So um, on top of that, we can see some indications for high flow oxygen therapy. Uh, so uh, as it was discussed in the video, so those include the hypoxemic respiratory failure, um, sometimes following extubation before th that can minimize the need of the intubation. And then, um, Sometimes you may consider using a, an obese patient following a cardiac and thoracic surgery, but we are not doing most of these surgeries in our context. And in a peri intubation period, so uh, what I have seen is like pre oxygenation with high flow, so we can prolong the time of apnea. I think this last one is interesting to most of us during anesthesia. So Sometimes you may have an obese patient or who, uh, who is going, undergoing bariatric surgery and like has 150 kilogram or 200, and then you need to minimize the, to maximize the time of apnea during intubation. This will be a good like use of high flow therapy in our context of anesthesia. So, um, I think this is clear, but also again, as it has been said in the video, don't delay escalation of, of, of therapy. So if you see that the patient is, is respiratory rate is not decreasing, the SPO2 is not going up, and the patient is having uh, increased work of breathing, uh, maybe CO2 is in, being increasing. So it's time to think about the next step. Do you need non-invasive ventilation, do you need intubation? So it's time to think about that early. And I think you have been talking about escalation of oxygen therapy from uh, simple uh, nasal cannula to face mask, to face mask with reservoir. Now we in included um, non uh, high flow nasal cannula. And then we may discuss about the next topic, which will be um, non-invasive ventilation. So Jean-Paul, do you have something to add before we move on? And if there is any question which is not clear, you, you can ask in the chat. So in the meantime, we can go down to the next slide. Yeah, we can go down to the next slide, please. Thank you. Keep going. Yeah, here are some questions you may think about. So which one of the following is incorrect? regarding the parameters set by provider when developing high flow. So provider can use the respiratory rate to estimate the, the initial flow setting needed for high flow oxygen therapy device. Providers can directly measure the flow at which a patient is breathing and match the respiratory flow demand on, on the high flow oxygen device. 
The average inspiratory flow of an adult is approximately 20 to 30 liters per minute. Uh, the flow rate set on high flow should attempt to meet or exceed patient inspiratory flow demand. Inspiratory flow demand increases during respiratory distress. So what is the wrong answer? Okay, people are very quiet. So, and most of them got the wrong answer. So for uh, the, the correct answer is B, um, because you can't measure directly the flow at which the patient is breathing. There is no way you can measure that. So, but you can have, for A is true because you can estimate the respiratory rate and then I try to match that to the flow setting. If the respiratory rate is high, it means you, you, you will say the patient may be in respiratory distress, so the, the inspiratory flow is increased. And then you can decide to increase your flow rate. And if the respiratory rate is low, the, then the inspiratory flow may be lower, then you can decide to, to decrease the flow. So C is correct because as we have been discussing, this is the average uh, inspiratory flow for an adult, 20 to 30 liters per minute. And for D, uh, the flow rate should attempt to meet or exceed the patient inspiratory flow demand. That's correct. That's your goal, so that you minimize the respiratory effort. So for E, inspiratory flow demand increases during respiratory distress. That's what happens. So we can go to the next question. So in which of the following scenarios would providers um, need to escalate care for high fluoxin therapy to either non-invasive post pressure ventilation or intubation with mechanical ventilation? So when the respiratory rate does not correct, or stabilize despite receiving high flow rate on the high, the high flow oxygen therapy device. When the patient partial pressure of CO2 remain elevated or worsened on arterial blood gas analysis despite receiving high flow rate on the high flow oxygen device. So when the SPO2 does not correct or stabilize despite receiving high FIO2 on a high production therapy device. When the partial pressure of oxygen does not correct or stabilize despite receiving high flow, high FIO2 on a high production device, or all of the above should lead to escalation to of care without delay. Yeah, keep going. I think most of the people got the right answer, which is E. So all those parameters, all those conditions, or all those situations may lead you to the escalation of care. Very good. So um, we are going now to discuss about ROX index. Which, how can this help clinical providers?
So before we click on that, we, we may calculate the ROX index for our patient. If I go to is 100%, uh, flow is 60 liters, and um, the respiratory rate is 35. So we decide if the patient high, has high risk of failure or not. So you can click on the link and then we, we, we try to calculate that. So you can put 100 for SPO2. Uh, so if I would, I think you can go back. I don't, I didn't record the SPO2. Yeah, SPO2 is 90, okay, good. Yeah, put 90 for SPO2, sorry. For the first one is 90, FIO2 is 100. And the respiratory rate is 35. So the index is 2.5. So as you can see, you will get even the interpretation. So there is a high risk of high flow nasocanular failure. Intubation should be considered. But uh, you can go down and I can, there's something I need to show people go up a little bit. Okay, click on why use it. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. So the ROX index is a simple bedside calculation using three clinical variables and is one easy way to summarize a patient degree of hypoxemic respiratory failure. It was created and studied to predict need for intubation post high flow nasal cannula, which is particularly important in COVID-19. Uh, so maybe if we can click on next steps and we see what you get down here. Yeah, click on evidence. That's what I was looking for, evidence. So go down. Yeah, keep going. Um, Go up a little bit here. Fact and figures. We don't need to spend much of time here. So all people can know is that once you increase one liter per minute, you are increasing about four percent on FiO2. So that one. So go down then. Yeah, about fact and figures. Yeah, that's what I needed people to see about the interpretation. So ROX index greater or equal to 4.88 measured at two hours, six and 12 hours after high flow is associated with lower risk for intubation. So this is the number you're looking for. So once you start high flow, you will measure ROX index at after two hours at six and 12. And then they decide if the risk of intubation is getting higher or not. So once you have ROX index below 3.85, so there is a high risk of failure. And the patient, you should start thinking about intubation. So once you have ROX, which is between 3.85 and 4.88, so you are not sure what to do. So what you do, you will repeat the measurement after one or two hours for further evaluation. So I think, I hope this is helpful. And you have access to the link of what you can do about that information. So this will be your measure on the success or failure of using high oxygen therapy. I don't know if Jean Paul has something to add or if something is not clear enough. So we can go back to the main slides. And remember, we don't need to memorize this. So you will have access to the link. You, you need to, to remember that the ROX index exists. Then once you need to use it, you can always check it online. 
Okay, we can go back to the main thread, please. Thank you. So, yeah, you have already calculated the, the ROX, and as you can see, the patient is deteriorating because they appear fatigued, and the arterial blood gas is showing um, low P pH and high PaCO2. Uh, so, you, 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 then the team will decide to try non invasive positive pressure ventilation. Yeah, we can go down. So this brings us very well. This brings us nicely to the discussion about non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. So remember, as we discussed for high flow oxygen therapy, so you need PPE for contact and the droplet and the bone precautions. So patient with potential infectious diseases can spread viral aerosols by speaking, coughing, and eating when not wearing a mask. Oxygen therapy that uses flow or pressure can also generate infectious viral aerosols. So non-invasive positive pressure is an aerosol generating intervention. So both patients and the providers should be in mask at all times until the risk of infection has been cleared. So we're not click, we're, we're not clicking on that. Rather, we're going to discuss about the objectives. So our objectives again are about, we need to be able to list indication for non-invasive positive pressure ventilation for acute respiratory failure. Uh, list proposed benefits and pos possible complications. So, Let's start with a question. What is the difference between non-invasive ventilation, um, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, continuous positive airway pressure, and by level positive air pressure or by power? So we can click on that and see. We can go down. So yeah, let's start with the second one uh, and uh, three, the third one, yeah. So does non-invasive pressure, does non-invasive positive pressure ventilation increase the risk of infection? So during the 2003 COVID-1 outbreak, many healthcare workers became infected due to failure to implement adequate infection precaution control. So that's why they started now considering um, this as a high risk. Okay, let's go back. So I don't think we have enough time to, to go in details about each of those, but we can go slowly and see how they are used. So remember that non-invasive ventilatory support can be used in a patient with acute or chronic respiratory failure. So chronic respiratory failure issues such as COPD and neuromuscular disorders, chest wall disease, uh, obstructive sleep apnea, obesity hypoventilation syndrome, will not be discussed here. So let's continue. Let's watch the video and then we, we can be able to understand CPAP and non-invasive ventilation. Hello, my name is Nick, and in this video, we're going to look at CPAP, a continuous positive airway pressure, and non invasive ventilation, also known as BIPAP, biphasic positive airway pressure. CPAP is a way of keeping the pressure positive in a spontaneously breathing patient's lungs. 
This positive pressure helps keep the smaller airways and alveoli open, which allows for additional gas exchange to take place by recruiting areas of the lung that might otherwise have collapsed down. A tight mask is applied to the patient's face to create a seal. Air and oxygen now flow through a circuit attached to the mask at high flow. The patient exhales through a valve, which closes when the desired pressure is achieved. This pressure created by the valve is known as PEEP, positive end expiratory pressure. It's this that leaves the pressure in the patient's lungs at the end of expiration. There are several type fitting masks that can be used. Oral masks, naso masks, full face masks and CPAP hoods. CPAP has been shown to be particularly useful in acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema and congestive heart failure, where in simple terms the positive pressure created helps push the fluid out of the lungs and into the circulation and prevents further fluid coming back into the lungs. It could also be used for pneumonia, sleep apnea and atelectasis. So what is non-invasive ventilation? Sometimes just keeping the alveoli open isn't enough, especially if the patient develops type 2 respiratory failure and starts to retain carbon dioxide. Think of non-invasive ventilation as CPAP with added zinc. Non-invasive ventilation is used to increase the size of each breath taken by the patient. It gives an assisted push behind the breath which increases its size and thus reduces carbon dioxide levels by blowing off CO2. It seems to be most useful in conditions such as exacerbation of COPD and post-extubation on ITU. Some of its success has been reported with asthma patients as well as certain other respiratory conditions where there may be a reluctance to sedate, intubate and ventilate a patient due to existing risk factors. So how does non-invasive ventilation work? As with CPAP, a tight-fitting mask is uh, fitted to the patient's face, but this time the patient breathes through a mechanical ventilator. On the ventilator, two pressures are set. Firstly, the positive end expiratory pressure, PEEP, similar to that used in CPAP, as before, this pressure helps preventing the alveolo from collapsing. Secondly, the pressure that creates the push. This is the inspiratory pressure, which increases the size of each breath or tidal volume. The bigger the pressure, the bigger the push, the bigger the tidal volume. So let's assume that we set the PEEP at 10 centimetres of water. The pressure in the patient's lungs will not drop below this level. It's now the baseline pressure, if you like. Now assume we set the inspiratory pressure at 15 centimetres of water. Note that the inspiratory pressure is added on top of the PEEP. As the patient takes the breath, it causes the ventilator to initiate. It now increases the pressure until the inspiratory pressure is achieved. Once the inspiratory pressure has been reached, the expiratory valve opens, the pressure begins to fall, and the patient exhales passively until the pressure drops back to the PEEP level, where the valve closes to maintain the pressure. The inspiratory pressure can be adjusted until the desired tidal volume has been achieved, usually about 6 to 8 mils per kilogram. In addition to the pressures in both non-invasive ventilation and CPAP, oxygen levels must be set. For various reasons, this is frequently referred to as the FiO2, or fraction of inspired oxygen. The FiO2 is expressed as a fraction so that 100% oxygen is expressed as an FiO2 of 1 and 21% oxygen is expressed as an FiO2 of 0.21. So, to summarise, CPAP uses high flow and positive pressure at the end of expiration to keep the alveoli open and improves oxygenation. Non-invasive ventilation gives a push behind each breath to increase the size of the tidal volume, which in turn lowers carbon dioxide levels. So that's it, a very basic overview of CPAP and non-invasive ventilation in under 5 minutes. That's why I like this. I like this video because it gives us a good overview or a good summary of the difference between CPAP and BiPAP. And also we can keep in mind the high flow or oxygen therapy we have discussed before. So we can see what is added with this. So you, you remember that now we have inspiratory pressure, which will push uh more oxygen uh, with each breath that will minimize the effort of the patient and also it can help with ventilation to remove the tendency or two so i don't know if people have more questions but you can try to answer the question here so there are two conditions 
leading to acute respiratory failure in adults that have very strong evidence to benefit for, from a non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. So maybe you can click on that. Yeah, I think people can use this as this paper to, to see all the details. But as you have seen, COPD and um, uh, congestive heart failure, those two uh, conditions benefit from, um, from like non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. So this is a good paper explaining that. So we can share the link with the, our audience. As you can see on the left, uh, COPD when used by level is preferred uh, and that will reduce, uh, that will reduce mortality and the rate of intubation and the hospital stay. And I think that's all we are looking for. And for cardiogenic pulmonary edema, uh, CPAP is preferred. So that will reduce intubation, dyspnea and mortality. So, and we see these patients very, they are very common, uh, in, even in our setting. So people with COPD and people with pulmonary edema of cardiac origin. So keep this in mind. So the other thing we need to think about before we go to the contraindications is the parameters to set. So I think you remember the parameters to set, uh, which can include FIO2, um, the PEEP and the inspiratory pressure. Remember, we're not setting the respiratory rate because the patient is breathing by himself. Okay, I, I hope that is clear enough as an introduction because I don't expect that oh, everyone is becoming an expert, but that's a foundation, then people can build on that. Okay, so let's discuss about contraindications. You can put the contraindications in the chat. Uh, yeah, before we show the contraindications, you can put them in the chat. We see what you, are, you, have, you already know. Yeah, remember we're, we're giving a mask on the patient. So what are the potential contraindications? So we have a big mask on, 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 on the either on the nose or on the, on the mouth. So what are the potential complications, uh, contraindications? Yeah. That's a, a contraindication. Yes, if the patient is vomiting, you can't put the mask on. What else? Facial burn, okay, yeah, or any facial injury, yeah. That's a contraindication. Full stomach, is full stomach a contraindication? Raw GCS, yeah, raw GCS may be a contraindication, yes. Obstructed upper airway, raw GCS. Okay, that's good. Let's go on the list below and see if we covered everything. So there's an absolute 
contraindication when there is urgent need of intubation or and mechanical ventilation. So if the patient is not breathing, so the respiratory arrest, or if the patient is in cardiac arrest, you can't use that. So relative contraindication include facial and neurologic surgery, trauma, deformities, as you said, bands part of that, upper GI breathing or active emesis, uh, cephalopathy, that goes with low GCS, need of prolonged mechanical ventilation. If you know someone is, for example, the severe ARDS may need mechanical ventilation for a long period of time. So that's not a good indication. Uh, inability to cooperate or protect the airway or clear secretions. Yeah, you said that a fire obstruction or inability of cooperation, low GCS agitation, obstructed the airway. So you've got most of them, which is very nice. Okay, let's go down and see how our patient is progressing. So our patient is placed on non-invasive positive pressure ventilation for one hour. With a pressure support of 15 and a PEEP of five. So that means the patient has a pressure of 20. So and his FIO2 is at 100%. But the respiratory rate is still at 35. He appears fatigued, he's slumped over in the bed and allows his own of shaking. So what do you think is the next step? Do you think the patient is getting better or worse? Yeah, you can put in the chat your next step. Yeah, the patient is getting worse. So what do you do? Yeah, very good. Yeah, I agree. I think the patient is getting worse uh, despite our management. And our next decision is to, to do intubation and put on mechanical ventilation. Yeah, and, and this brings us really towards the end of our discussion. Um, so people will have access to this. Um, so you can go down. Yeah, so this is the end of our discussion. So maybe you can go back to our objectives and the review if we have achieved all of the objectives before we finish. Uh, so remember we had uh, objectives to cover um, the, in, the introduction to high oxygen therapy, where we need everyone to be able to understand the upper limit of low flow device, differentiate between low flow and high flow, understand when to escalate to high oxygen therapy, uh, and at least some benefit of high flow, uh, discuss pos possible complications and understand how to increase or decrease high oxygen therapy. So for non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, we needed to discuss indications and uh, benefits and complications. So I think we covered an overview of these two topics, but that doesn't mean that we have become the experts in the field. So it, this is a foundation where we can build on and have better understanding. And once you have these devices available to us, we can use them efficiently and effectively. So I don't know if Jean Paul has something to add, uh, but I, ho I hope that we learned uh, something from this discussion. Jean Paul, do you, are you still there?
Okay, so probably we can ask everyone to put their takeaway message, one take home message in the chat, and then we we finish from there. Yeah, let's have one takeaway message from everyone in the chat, and then we can finish by that. Yeah, and Alana will give us uh, the plan for uh, our next session and talk about how you get your certificate. Yeah, Alan, you, you can talk about the certificate and the plan for next month. Then Great. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, just to wrap up the session, uh, all of the resources that were presented today are available on the Learning Resource Center. The, this is an online course platform that contains all of the slides, all of the recordings, and some additional uh, materials, including job aids, quizzes, videos, and more. The link to create a student account is in the chat and we encourage all of you to do so. To receive a certificate of attendance for participating in today's session, uh, please use the link that I just shared in the chat. Uh, you will be prompted to share your email and your name as you would like it displayed. Uh, and once you do so, an, a certificate will be emailed to you. If you do not receive a certificate for previous sessions or a link to uh, receive your certificate, uh, please message me in the chat or email me and we can we can resolve that. Finally, we would encourage all of you to join our community WhatsApp group. This is a space for you to ask questions between sessions, including about the material, about any challenges you might be having in your clinical setting, and more. Uh, to join, please message me. My number is on the screen and I will add you to the group. And I will also add a direct link to, to join the group in the chat in just a moment. Uh, thank you so much to Dr. Eugene and Dr. Jean-Paul for leading today's session. Uh, thank you to all of our participants for joining in uh, so late on the Saturday. Thank you to our funders at Project ECHO for making this program possible. And we hope to see you at our next session, which will be, take place at the end of August August 28, 2021, and the topic will be considerations for pediatric populations. If you have any further questions, always feel free to message me or you can email echo at assistinternational.org. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Goodbye, everyone. Have a nice weekend.